Yo, peace and what's good. Welcome to World War Wrestling. Got a new mic. Ah, uh, baby girl invested in me. She saw my vision in my dream, so becoming the number one YouTube world wrestling podcaster, I guess, is the goal. It's a very, very soft-spoken, I don't talk a lot in my everyday life. I try not to. If I do, it's usually a rant about politics or religion or something of that nature. And it's not for everyone, so... It's good to have a microphone. And I couldn't really think of a better way to start off having a microphone. <laughs> like, I had a microphone, but, like, having, like, a real microphone where I could use my hands to talk and do stuff, you know, it's cool. It's cool to be able to move around, and I hopefully don't have to worry about the audio quality going in and out because my arm got tired of holding the microphone. Um, sorry about if the gain or whatever these settings are that you're looking at are off. You can look at it and let me know because then it would help me. So first episode with a microphone, we have Elimination Chamber in Perth, Australia. And we have No Surrender and a gym or something. And I, I just couldn't think of two better juxtaposed production styles, styles of wrestling, AJ styles, and styles of just storytelling than between these two completely different settings. I remember Triple H coming out before the main event to brag or announce, whichever you want to call it, that the show in Perth had 52,900 people in attendance, probably give or take a few single digits there, double digits there, you know. 900 on the dot is way too specific trips. Probably 921, 999, you know, something like that. But 900 seems way, way too specific. Unless there's like a 100 capacity for the people that work there, which I might be might be reasonable to assume, including the wrestlers and staff. You know, it's a lot of people to have one building. That's 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 an astounding amount of people to have one building compared to about. I don't even want to say 500, maybe 1,000 people, maybe 5,000 people. Like, I have no idea inside of this gym arena that they're having no surrender at. And, of course, no surrender was the better show overall. But it's hard not to give in to the pristine and presentation and grandiose of WWE, it's really hard not to be involved in all the pageantry of WWE, even just seeing how much Eric Young and King Kaz changing their theme songs made such a difference in their presentation. You could see why WWE is the main show. If you are going to spend 50 bucks on a wrestling ticket, you might be better off sitting in the nosebleeds of a WWE show at the Prudential Center than you are shoveling for room at No Surrender. But I would tell you that No Surrender would probably be the better buy, probably the better value. I feel like if AEW, which I'm going to watch pretty soon after this, I believe, I don't know. I don't know what the plans are for the future, even though they're the near future. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I feel like AEW should take this kind of approach. Ring of Honor should take this kind of approach. Even TNA can apply this to what they're already doing, but do it better. Is I like the idea of doing shows at these smaller arenas. I like, especially if you're already filming it, you know, like NWA or something like that. Have these small arenas 
but make them look larger than life. Like, take the school gym, but make the school gym look like Perth fucking Australia. Like, make the school gym look like fucking Madison Square Garden. I imagine that's a lot of material to carry around and to transport. I imagine that's probably extra labor and probably a higher level of labor than you're used to hiring. But if you can hire a set design engineer or something of that nature, of that nature, someone who like works on Broadway or something of that nature that creates sets, that creates scenes, you could probably find an affordable way to transform these rinky-dink locations, excuse me for lack of better words, I apologize for that, but these rinky-dink locations, I said it again, so I must not be that sorry, uh, and turn them into these amazing events. I feel like that's the only real difference between TNA and WWE, is that even though WWE is the same kind of like GCW wrestling, the same kind of MLW wrestling, is presented a lot better. And it's like the presentation alone, more than anything else, is what really denotes the difference between Elimination Chamber and No Surrender. It's interesting because it, TNA has the system, but I don't think it gets more systematic and more formulaic than WWE Wrestling. Literally, Beat by beat by beat by beat. All of it, all of it was pretty like systematic. You have put up the women's match. You have a few entertaining bits in between men's match. Main event. Main event was pretty good. The ending of the main event was pretty shitty though. Which kind of brings back to the whole formulaic thing. Is like, oh, well, no one else gets to win in their hometown. I guess Rhea Ripley gets to win in her hometown. You came pretty damn far for her not to win, though. So I would imagine that that was a necessity more than anything else to really make it a successful pay-per-view. It's like everyone came there just to see Grayson Waller and Rhea Ripley. And even then, they didn't really... Excuse me, Grayson Waller got a much bigger pop than Rhea Ripley did, which kind of blew my mind, you know? I felt like after the Elimination Chamber match, everyone was kind of worn out. You hear the, ooh, ah, ooh, during the Elimination Chamber match, but every other match was kind of like, maybe it's just me, maybe it's my memory. Um, but everything else was kind of like low-key dead for the side. I don't, I'm just like comparing... The way that this impact, like the impact faithful, the TNA faithful, go absolutely crazy and ballistic for TNA wrestling. Uh, you didn't really have that in, in Perth. Probably because this isn't their usual location. Probably because this is the first show they've ever had in Perth, Australia. But you, you really didn't hear the crowd going crazy for Elimination Chamber. And maybe because it was kind of... I'm like... I'm thinking specifically about the main event here. And maybe just because it wasn't that good of a match. Like, it started off and it looked like what they had been doing on Raw and SmackDown for the past weeks anyway. And then Rhea Ripley hit a terrible fucking uh, riptide. And I think everyone expected Nia Jax to kick out. And she didn't, and then it was over. And that was that was it. That was kind of like the whole thing. Mustafa Ali versus Chris Sabin. They go literally around the entire fucking moon to deliver a great match. You know, Moose versus Alex Shelley break out everything you possibly can to pull out a great match. And I'm not saying that Elimination Chamber wasn't good. I'm just saying that Elimination Chamber was kind of... I can see why hardcore wrestling fans don't watch WWE anymore. I can see it. I can understand I could see why so many people were standing behind AEW. 
I can see why there are so many people who are like fanatically obsessed with TNA. I really do get it now because WWE just is not producing the greatest product anymore. And unless you're really watching these other shows, it's hard to kind of realize that. Nothing showed me this better than Tiffany Stratton. And I want to word this kind of correctly here. They have what should be a triple threat talent. She has everything going for her. She's super young. She's put in probably one of the biggest matches of her career. But she's already starting off as such a deplorable, hateful heel. There's no real room to go from there. Like, it would take way too much to try to then turn Tiffany Stratton into a baby face. So then if there is any real critiques about Tiffany Stratton's anything, you can just hype it up to heat, but you won't be able to get specifically at what's wrong with the product. And I feel like that's kind of WWE. It's been promoting itself as the heel company for so long, it's hard to kind of pinpoint what it is you don't like about it without just sounding like a mark or sounding like a hater because you're not supposed to like it because it is the authority, because it is just what's best for business, because it is a heartless, cold corporation. Excuse me. But you don't necessarily get the perspective at all that WWE is trying to do anything to please its fans. Sorry about that. I had a phone call. I had the decency to have my phone on silent, but I did not have the decency to not pick up the phone, given that the person who called me was the person that bought me the mic. So let's always be grateful for that, no matter what. Um... And I like Tiffany Stratton. I like pro wrestling. WWE is probably the biggest reason why I like pro wrestling. But because before I got a chance to watch Impact Wrestling or TNA Wrestling week to week, all I had was WWE. Before I got a chance to see any of this, before AW even existed, all I had was WWE. And, you know, like, I remember going back to watch all the old episodes of TNA as soon as I got the chance. I remember swallowing all of Lucha Underground when I had the chance. I love pro wrestling. And as someone who loves pro wrestling, No Surrender was a far better pay-per-view than Elimination Chamber. In the sense that every element of how TNA utilizes its, its women's talent, they don't utilize the women as a gimmick. They utilize the women as wrestlers and talent having real matches, not having theatrical plays and performances. I mean, they are to the extent that it's professional wrestling, but they aren't to the extent that it's not sports entertainment on TNA. WWE is so over the board in sports entertainment. I just feel like the Nia Jax match could have been a lot more competitive. Maybe Nia Jax got tired. I don't know. That's not a shot at being a big girl. But I remember one of the commentators making a note of how tired they all were, given whatever the fuck. I don't remember seeing Roman Reigns or seeing The Rock on Elimination Chamber. That was kind of a disappointment, but in the same sense, not really. Not really, because I think we need to get ready for a world post-Bloodline, post-Roman Reigns because they, they just can't do it forever. They could, actually. They probably could. I mean, honestly, Roman Reigns trying to get the title back might be a better story than Roman Reigns having the title. A year of Roman Reigns trying to get the story, the, the title back to become champion again is way, way bigger than... way way, way, way bigger than just him having the title. Just about. Um, 
I need to get going soon to help my uh, lady with the kid. You know, got to be a good dad. But I wanted to give y'all something, and I've like taken a break from a lot of stuff, so it's nice to kind of get back into the groove of things and pick up the pace on a lot of projects that I've left behind while waiting for this microphone to come and trying to get organized on my end. I knew I had to make some improvements with the production, but I don't really have anywhere else to record. Um, so the echo, something we're going to deal with for a little bit until I find a broom closet or something to stuff myself into, I don't know. Uh, but at least a microphone could have been a great improvement for you guys. And I'm going to look into also recording audiobooks that is not for the pro wrestling fans, but just for the people that are here for me specifically. And thank you so much. My mic, my mom liked the microphone, so I imagine that other people would like the microphone. And hopefully you would like the improved audio quality. Peace. This was World War Wrestling.